and hang out and play some games after. But um, just a couple of announcements. Um, house parties start this week. Who's excited for house parties? Woo! Yeah, so we're finally meeting up again in our squads and our house parties, as, um, as we've called it. And so if you haven't been plugged into a house party yet, please let us know, either myself, um, Jacques, or even Pastor Jer, if he comes up here, um, if you haven't been placed in a house party yet, and we want to get you connected to your leaders and your squads and get to know the them. It's going to be sick. So from Tuesday to Thursday, um, every week, we're going we're to be doing house parties, um, dependent on where um, each leader is um, doing, doing the house party yet. So yeah, really in contact with your leaders, it's going to be a fun time. Also, I don't know if there's any great 11, 12s here, but we're launching this new thing called Influence, which used to be called the Intern. So um, if you want to be part of our student leadership team, please join Influence. It's going to be such a cool time. Um, it starts October 19th, so if you're from, if you're grade 11 or 12 and interested in, in leadership and learning more about the Bible and learning more about, again, leadership and, and serving, um, this thing is for you. So yeah, let, again, let myself or Pastor Jared know um, if you'd be interested in that, but yeah, it's going to be a fun time. It's going to be a good semester, guys. Um, okay, Emmanuel, can you bring it now? Guys, I'm so excited to, to invite my friend Jacques. He's going to be bringing the word this morning. I'm so excited for what the Lord has um, imparted on his heart and the word that he's going to bring this morning. So get to your feet, stand to your feet, and let's give Jacques the biggest round of applause. Yes. sound like it, but I really hope you guys are good. I am excited to be here. This is the first time I am ever speaking at youth, so bear with me, but no, I'm really excited to, to share with you guys this week. Um, and so what is the series we're in? I'm sure you guys know at this point. Anyone? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, so we're Week three for of the this year's for the people in the back. And today I get to talk on the wonderful topic of fear. And I think it's a, a topic that all of us has to deal with every single day of our lives, no matter where you are or what you're doing. Fear always shows up and, and tries to steal our joy and, and take your eyes off of Jesus. And so I think uh, a question that I just have for you guys, and you guys don't necessarily, I would encourage if you guys just want to take a second, discuss with someone next to you, what are you the most scared of today? Like what in your life is impacting how you're actually living it? What is causing you to fear what lies ahead? And if you, if you don't have anyone to discuss, even if you don't want to right now, it's just something to think about and, and take to Jesus throughout this week and re refocus, recenter your eyes on that. And so today I will jump in with my first verse. So it's Joshua 1, and then I'll be reading from verse 3 to 6, and then 7 and 9 as well. So give me a second. And so before I, whoops, sorry. So before I start reading, uh, I'll, I'll just give a quick rundown of who Joshua is. So Joshua was Moses' per personal aide. And so as his aide, he probably got to see Moses, has some of his most personal encounters with, with God, and actually had an incredible leader or someone that, that guided him and mentored him in life. He was also one of the two spies that actually said we should go into the land and not one of the ten spies that said that, that lived in fear and resulted in the Israelites living 40 years in the desert. And so that's just a bit of a, the preface of who he is. And, and what I really want you guys to focus on is everything that God tells him um, in this little portion of scripture that, scripture that I'll be reading. So starting in verse three, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised to Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. 
As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So, so that's verse, verses 3 to 5. And I think the most important part in that is just looking at the promises that God gives him. So he says, I will give you all of this land as I promised Moses. So this is a promise that Joshua is very much aware of, and he knows that this is the whole promise that Israel is basing this journey off. Uh, and he has personally seen God move, and he knows God quite well at this point, having been one of the spies and being under, under Moses. He tells him everything that he will take in, and he says, I will be with you in every single part of your life. But I want you to focus on what God still has to tell him next in verse 6. So after he says all of this, gives him all these promises, reminds him of who he is and, and who he's called him to be, he says, be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to your ancestors to give them. So he just has to remind him not to focus on fear. To actually take the courage to take this step where no one else has been. Because that's the thing. Each of us will be called in our life to go places where no one else has gone and where we haven't gone before. And we can either choose to live in faith or to live in fear. And by living in fear, we're choosing... To, to not trust God and be like, okay, you know what, I see this and I want to focus on what I can see in the physical. And so many times this leads to us living lives way below what we were called to live. And I think what, what's important as I'll read here is God doesn't just tell him this once. If you look in verse 7, he says right after this, be strong and very courageous. He, he wants to let Joshua know that he understands where his heart's at that he knows that Joshua is, is shaking in his boots and like, okay, you know what, God? I may have said I trust you and we're going to go into this, but I haven't been there. You know how these people are. You know how it is to lead Israel. And even Moses couldn't get us into this promised land. And you're telling me that I'm going to be the one that gets everyone to go where, where you promised us to go to. And then for, for, for extra measure, if you look in verse 9, He's, God says again, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And I think it's such a great way how God ties it together in the end. He knows that Joshua's heart is still focusing on fear. And that's the thing. It doesn't matter where we have gone with God. Fear is always going to show up and try to tell you that, you're not enough. This is not going to work here. You know what? If I don't see all the answers, it's not worth going for. And I think that's what's beautiful about Joshua's life here is no matter where you are in your journey with God, we are all going to encounter fear and have a chance to either focus on God, focus on Jesus and trust him, or we can focus on the fear and let that impact how we make every one of our decisions. In that last part of verse 9, he just says, where he says, do not be afraid. So the word afraid can be afraid, scared. It can also mean dread. So don't dread anything that's coming your way. And I think that that's the thing is Joshua's like, okay, God, I'll trust you. So I, I can just imagine him having this conversation with God and be like, okay, God, I'll trust you. But in his heart, he's still like, ah, oh, I really don't want to do this. And so God's just wanting to encourage him time after time because he knows where each and every one of us is at in our walk. And he knows that no matter what, he, we will have moments where we, we are shaken and we, and we don't want to go forward with it. But he walks with us every step of the way. And I think the cool part is, it's not up on the screen, but just how it ends with Joshua 24, verse 15. It, it just kind of shows at the end of Joshua's life. Um, so Joshua ends up obeying God and Israel takes over. The, well, the, the promised land. They inherit the promised land. And at the end, in, in verse 15, Joshua says to the Israelites, Sorry. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. And I think that just shows how this whole journey, how it starts off with him just coming to God. And I think the amount of times that he probably did just come to God and was like, you know what, I am really scared of what lies ahead. And then choosing to put his trust and faith in, G in God at that point, by the end of his life, he knows the fruit that it's brought. He knows the transformed life that he has. 
And he says, but as for me and my household, I will trust in the Lord. And I think that's, that's ultimately what, what, what my hope is for each and every one of you guys. Because through our lives, our faith will be tested. We will have difficult times and there's no way that is going to be avoided. It's just, what do I turn to? And so uh, I have a quote here by uh, John Maxwell. So he's uh, one of the great leader coaches, or he really sits down with large corporations and their CEOs and really trains a, a lot of leaders. And so his quote was just, a faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. And that's the thing. Like, all of our faiths will be tested. And we can either choose, as I said, to, to live in faith and trust that Jesus is with us every step of the way. And it's okay if we mess up. He's going to be walking there every step of the way, and it is a journey. But this is just a call to, to not be trapped or get caught up in living in fear because it definitely takes away so much of the joy that there is today, but each and every day of our lives. And so for, for my next um, verse that we're going to, it's uh, Psalm 56, verse 1 through 4. And so this is a psalm by David. And at the start of this psalm, it gives a nice description where um, he's being pursued by his enemies. So he's, he's fearing for his life uh, as he writes this. But I just really want you guys to focus on the transition of how the first two verses start to how the last two verses end that I'll be reading. So he starts off with asking God, be merciful to me, my God. For my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long, they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. And then he says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And I think what's so beautiful with this is that David is completely honest with where, where he's at. He doesn't try to sugarcoat it. He, he doesn't try to look good or, or say anything that his heart truly doesn't feel. He, he starts, and so many of the Psalms are so beautiful in that it starts out with a cry of the heart, whether it's based in fear or, or sadness or any of these things, it, just coming to God with an open and honest heart and be like, this is how I feel right now. And then when he comes to God and says, you know what, I'm so scared of all these people pursuing me. Am I going to die? Am I actually going to see all the promises you've given me? This isn't what I signed up for. And um, oh God, I, I just imagine, like, in, as he's writing these first two verses, God just shows up to him, and he realizes that when he's afraid, he'll put his trust in the Lord because God is closest to him in those moments. He knows exactly when we need to be strengthened, when, when we are at the end of ourselves. And then as he says um, later on, he will continue to praise God. He will trust and don't not be afraid. And then the last question I think that he asks is so beautiful. What can mere mortals do to me? And that really spoke to me because as an individual, I really do struggle at times with wanting to have others' approval or not being, wanting to disappoint others in my life or those close to me. And I think that that's such a great question. It gets them to the point is, do I live for what others think of me? Do I live for what what the world's approval is of me or their opinion or do I actually live for what God's opinion is of me because I think like it really gets down to am I good enough and I think that David is realizing that you know what I can fully trust him I'm accepted for who I am and it's going to be difficult at times but I know the fruit of this of, of trusting God is a life that overflows and so there's another quote that I, I just love so th um, it's by Blake Healy and he's with Bethel Atlanta, and he says, um, like in his books, he talks about seeing the spirit, but his, his whole idea is, if you aren't seen from heaven's perspective, it's not worth seeing, and I think that's, that's so important, coming, coming to the feet of Jesus and just asking him for his perspective, because so many times we have our own perspective on these things, and it's so easily tainted by what we've experienced or, or the losses we've had. But when we can just refocus on that, it completely frames life differently. It allows us to live with a lot of hope. And so for the last one, oh, wait, okay, yes. So for the last one, um, we'll, we'll be looking at Jesus and his life. And so this is from Luke 22, verse 39 to 44 I'll be reading. 
And so at this point uh, in Luke, Jesus um, has just had the Last Supper, and he, he kind of knows what's coming. He, he knows at this point what he, he's here on earth for. He's here to ultimately die for our sins. And I think that it's so beautiful to show Jesus in this place because it makes him relatable to each and every one of us. The, the, the reality is Jesus, we, we so easily think of Jesus had everything together at all times, but if he was fully man and fully God, he, he understood the pain and suffering that each and every one of us is going through. He had his moments where he was like, I don't know what this is about. Why do I have to suffer like this? Or even at this point, he knows that, he's, that he needs to die on the cross to die for our sins, but he just shows, he tells God, I really don't want to. <laughs> Honestly, I don't want to die a painful death. And I think it's, it's so beautiful to show that Jesus was completely honest with where he was at, and he didn't need to try and pretend he was anything he wasn't. And I think that makes it easy to remember that Jesus is really relatable to us. He knows the things that cause us the deepest fear, the things that really impact our heart or what really um, influences us in our decisions, what really consumes our thoughts or, or what's the most important things to us in our lives. And so reading from this, and this is when Jesus um, goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. Reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And I think like, what it really does show there is that Jesus, in that moment, he's at his weakest. And so many times when we're at our weakest, we run to something that makes us feel good, whether that's going on social media, whether we have a specific game or going to specific people in our lives, that we just want to be encouraged. We want to feel okay. And that's totally understandable because God made us for a relationship with him. The problem is when we put these things in front of running to Jesus, at our weakest points. Because if you look at Jesus here, he is at his worst, at his weakest point that he is. He's in anguish. He doesn't want to do this at all. I can't imagine the internal struggle that he's experiencing um, and, and even just not, and just how weak he is physically as well as spiritually. Like I would think at this moment, this is a perfect time. Earlier on um, in Matthew and Luke, when Jesus is tempted in the desert, um, Satan tempts him, and then at the end, a key verse is, and Satan withdrew and waited for an opportune time. And I can just imagine that in this moment, what we don't see is as Jesus is sitting there, crying out, not wanting to do this, Satan's just being there, you know what, why, why do you have to do this? God's not good. He wouldn't, if God is good, he wouldn't want you to die. Well, why would he want you to experience this pain? I can just imagine all these lies that are being told to him, and then there's such a great opportunity for Jesus to believe and live in fear rather than living in faith. But it does cost him his everything, which, <laughs> which is, is pretty scary. Um, but I think what's so beautiful in this as well is right at the end um, where it says, being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And so can you imagine that you're so stressed you're so scared, and you're living, well, Jesus isn't so much for, he, he doesn't want to do this. He's actually sweating blood. So these, at this point, like the small blood vessels in his, in his skin have burst from the amount of stress that he has. And at that point, what I think is so beautiful is like it says this, and then when he finished praying, he got up and went to his disciples, and then Jesus was ready, and then he, he, he went up and he, he went and got crucified. But I think what's beautiful at this for me is the image of Jesus being at his weakest physically, but at his strongest spiritually, because he sat at the feet of his father. He knew that in the midst of this, that God was with him. And because God was with him, it might not be easy, it might not be fun, but being in the center of God's will is the best place to be. And so I think 
and really get to the idea that whenever each of us are at our lowest point, the place where we get strengthened is by taking that time and withdrawing from others and just sitting at the feet of Jesus and saying, I trust you. Because the reality is we have so many things that, that tell us that we can trust it, but ultimately it's not a solid foundation. Jesus loves you exactly as you are. He knows exactly what you're walking through. And he's okay with it when you mess up. He, he, he wants your heart. He wants to journey with you through life. Just like he journeyed with the disciples. If you look at how Jesus was, was with the disciples, how they started out and how they ended up, is it was a constant journey of walking with Jesus that changes you and changes your heart. Only by taking, having those moments of having our faith tested and failing at times, which so many things you, you learn through failure, and that's okay. And just coming back to Jesus' feet and be like, you know what? I choose to trust you. I know that you do love me. And so uh, I think a, a question that um, I would like you guys to at least just like think about a bit this week is what decisions in your life are driven by fear and not by faith? And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question, even in my own life, um, with my decisions for my future. I'm finishing up at university here soon and just having to find a job um, and wanting to obey God's call for my life, even at times where it feels contrary to, to what I want to do. And so taking that time to just ask that question and then to give it up to Jesus with your hands open. So with that, I'll call up the, call up the band. Um, and I'll just, uh, just give us a quick prayer. Um, so Jesus, thank you that you love us dearly. We just invite you in to the moments where we experience fear the most. strength to keep doing this when something happens or like do I feel qualified? I don't feel qualified enough to do this. Uh, but God is saying that He He is He's 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 for you. of my own life resonates with that. Like, I don't know if I can do this. I think, God, you're crazy. I'm sorry, I blow my gun. If he's called you to it, he won't let you fail. Like, he won't let you down. He will never let you down. So we're going to sing this song. I want everyone to close their eyes for a moment and just like raise out your arms like this as if you're receiving something from heaven. And I want you to actually, more, more than just singing this song, I want you to actually hear uh, what God is speaking to you in this moment. Because as much as there's that relationship of wanting to pursue God, God is actually pursuing you too. He pursues you in your imperfection. He pursues you in your weakness. He pursues you regardless. He loves you.
church that this morning that the message resonate with our hearts so deeply this week that we go on. You know, would you remind us that you're always here for us, that you're with us, that you're pursuing us, that you're pursuing our hearts. We thank you that you're so kind, that you're such a kind father. Feel free to hang.